That indictment does have nine charges on it. A grand jury convened during the COVID-19 pandemic. Three men indicted for murder in the shooting death of Ahmad Aubrey in Georgia. This is another positive step, another great step for finding justice for Ahmad. Plus, a Latino man dies following an arrest in Tucson, Arizona. The files for these officers reflect that the department would have terminated them had they not resigned. The chief's shocking announcement at his press conference. I am offering my resignation. Right now on Law & Crime Special Report, Keeping the Peace. It's Tuesday, June 25th, 2020. Okay, welcome back. My name is Bob Bianchi. This is Law & Crime Special Report, Keeping the Peace. It's uh, June 25th, 2020. So the Ahmaud Aubrey case, this is like really an amazing case. Three people indicted for hunting down, in my mind, and shooting and killing the victim in this case. The district attorney, Joyette Holmes, uh, Cobb, gave an interview yesterday with regard to these charges. Let's take a listen. That judicial emergency order allowed us to bring in grand jurors who had already been impaneled, as long as we could do it in a safe way that went with the public health guidelines as well as social distancing. So we do again thank you, Sheriff, for making those accommodations such that the grand jurors could be safe as they came in to bring forward that indictment. That indictment does have nine charges on it. Those nine charges are malice murder, four counts of felony murder, and four felonies under which the predicates for the felony murder charges. Um, as we have brought forward this indictment today, and the grand jury did issue a true bill, and we had it um, signed in to the court, to the clerk's office by the judge, we will be moving forward with this prosecution in next steps. Of course, some of the regular uh, processes that we'd have are still on a, a bit of a slowdown because of the judicial emergency. But as motions are filed and scheduled to be heard, we will be here and ready. This is another positive step, another great step for finding justice for Ahmad, for finding justice for this family and the community beyond. Okay, Kirk Burkholter, uh, a regular here at the Law and Crime Network, professor now, uh, retired detective, first grade NYPD. Uh, I want to go through some law here so that people understand what's going on. That Now, they're alleging, the defendants in this case, that this uh, victim was engaged in burglaries in the area, and they went in pursuit of him for that reason. Uh, the other side is saying, no, he was just jogging in the neighborhood. Um, and the owners of the home that supposedly were involved in the alleged potential burglary, which was unoccupied at the time, showed some footage of many people going to that location, but there was nothing there and nothing stolen from him. But let's get to what the law is, because this is the bottom line, Kirk. Uh, the bottom line is that in, even in Georgia, which is a stand-your-ground state, you do not have a right to pursue somebody and use deadly force um, in an instance of protecting your property. And these guys went after him, and the, the, the B-roll that we saw there, the shooting, was pretty brutal, shot with a shotgun a couple of times. What are your thoughts? Uh, you're you're dead on. You know, it's a basic tenet of American law that you may not use different types of force and deadly physical force to defend property. It's different if someone is using deadly physical force against another or yourself, then you can meet that force with deadly physical force. But this was in defense of property. And the malice charge here, the, the malice murder, stems from the fact that they basically hunted him down for that limited amount of time and intended to kill him. And, and, and you can, I guess, uh, it, the intent is inferred from them hunting him down with the shotguns. This seemed to be a coordinated a attempt to capture him, and certainly right. the underlying charge being the felony murder. Right, and the... Uh, the malice part of it is that it was intentional. Um, no argument with regard to self-defense here. This guy's in possession of a shotgun, and this young man is actually, you could tell, trying to defend himself when he's got a gun pointed at or in his direction. I can't even see a self-defense here. Thoughts? I don't see it either. You know, that's like uh, me going out to commit a robbery with a firearm, and when that person fights me off, I shot him because I was attempting to defend myself while I was committing a crime. So here they were making the attempt an attempt at unlawful imprisonment uh, at the least. Their defense is going to be that they were making some type of lawful citizens arrest and they used the necessary force to effect that arrest. 
I don't think that defense is going to hold water at all because they started off from a point that was incorrect. They didn't have the authority to do so. Uh, they didn't have all the facts. And as you correctly mentioned, uh, once the jury sees the parade of folks enter the construction site and look around, adults to children, you know, the question is going to be, well, why did they feel they had to hunt down Ahmaud Aubrey? Right. And this is what happens when you have guns and citizens that are acting, some would say, in a vigilante-like style. The answer to what to do in a situation like that as a citizen is to call 911. That's the answer to that. Now these individuals are facing a potential life without parole or potential death penalty uh, cases, I understand, Georgia yeah. law. Real quick, Kirk, what do you think about this idea of the grand jury convening? We're having a big problem with that in New Jersey, where uh, there's been a big debate as to whether you can convene virtual grand juries. They tried to do that but it got shot down on Sixth Amendment uh, issues that this would be improper. But here they actually got this grand jury together in what is, quote, unquote, a safe manner in order to come forward with this indictment. I think they're making a big public statement with that. Oh, absolutely. I think that the DA here felt, given the uh, newsworthiness of this and the public outcry, uh, that it was appropriate to keep the case moving forward. So what is a Indictment mean it means that this case can now move forward towards trial. Um, there are many issues with impaling a grand jury under these conditions. However, um, I think that they are probably ready for any type of constitutional challenge. I'm sure they weighed the counter arguments from the other side. But I think it was the correct move here, given the nature of the case. Yeah, and also the family who is waiting for justice in this case. Let's listen to the district attorney speaking about the family's reaction to this indictment. So the presentation, would you say, was about um, an hour and a half? Better part of the morning, yes, ma'am. Yeah, and then the uh, true bill came back in less than 10 minutes. Can you speak again to the family's reaction to when you called them and with this coming just after that hate crime bill? Oh, the family was ecstatic to hear that it had happened this morning. Of course, with everything that's going on just around the country, with the judicial emergency that's in place, they had no idea when some of the next steps would happen after the last preliminary hearing. So to get that phone call that we were able to call in a grand jury and to do it safely and that they returned a true bill, they were extremely happy about that. Is there still a possibility of federal hate crime charges? So the Department of Justice has been um, concurrently talking to us about information that we have, um, information that came out during the preliminary hearing. I don't think any decisions have been made as to whether they'll move forward with that, but we know that they have information that we have um, been able to share a lot through publicly through the preliminary hearing and then after the presentation through the grand jury's indictment. Kirk, she gave a good press conference. I'm often critical of these prosecutors when they're giving these press conferences, but I thought it was unusual. She actually talked about how fast the grand jury came back with uh, actual deliberations. Uh, that's usually something that's off limits. Yes, it's very interesting. Um, grand jury proceedings, by their nature, are secretive. Now, I'm not going to argue whether that's you know proper or improper, but that is the law. The grand jury proceedings are secretive, and that's why you rarely see prosecutors discuss this. However, I think that uh, I would believe that given the video and all the newsworthiness of the case, the uh, DA is attempting to err on the side of transparency. And I just want to mention also, you know, something that's important here. She mentioned the family. In this case, the family has been re-victimized over and over by this video being shown and the, uh, the defendants not being arrested and so forth. So I think that was important. Probably another reason why she impaneled the grand jury. We see this often that uh, victims' families sometimes are re-victimized. You know, we saw this with the Floyd case and, and others. Yeah, that's a great point you're making, and, and it really is true. They go through the whole judicial process and have to relive the whole scenario again. Uh, and I can't count how many times as a prosecutor them getting upset that defense attorneys were actually attacking the credibility of the victim. And they, you know, that's a, it's a rough process, and a good prosecutor tries to explain to them, you got to crawl before you walk, and we want to bring you justice, but he has, the defendants, are going to have constitutional rights, and you may be upset about what you're going to hear in court. So take a deep breath. It's a long road to go. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah.
Yeah, so what do, you, what do you think about this hate crime legislation that's coming out? And can you talk to us a little bit about the idea of ex post facto, the Latin term for after the fact, that you cannot be charged with a crime uh, that had been committed previously if a new law comes into effect? Certainly. And that's an important tenet under our law. So imagine that, uh, you know, a law uh, is passed today that if you steal five cents, that's a felony. And all of a sudden, hey, Bob, uh, I was in kindergarten with you and you stole a nickel from me and that was X amount of years ago. So now I'm going to arrest you. So it's an important tenant and it goes back to uh, our history as a colony under, uh, under the British. So I think it's a good step that Georgia passed this law. They are probably in the minority of states who did not have some type of hate crime law. However, I think it would be unreasonable to expect that the law would be retroactive because it's so important. Uh, sometimes we have to keep in mind not only what's the situation here, but what are the other ramifications, what would be the other effects to all the potential defendants out there. Yeah, uh, I mean, listen, I've been saying this for a while. Uh, we have to make sure that we have reform, but also not throw out cherished constitutional principles that are there, mostly to protect people to have a right to a fair trial. I will tell you, I was shocked shocked to hear that Georgia had not had a hate crime statute, and there are still three other states, according to my friend Brian Buckmeyer, that still don't have it. Unbelievable. we got to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Keeping the Peace. Okay, Tucson, Arizona. A grandmother calls 911 saying that her grandson was acting crazy, running around naked. Crazy was the term that we're being told was used. Police officers respond. It ultimately results in a fatality in police custody. Uh, you're going to find this video hard to watch. It's dark. It's in a garage. But let's take a quick look. First and foremost, I want to extend my sympathy and regrets to the family of Carlos Ingram Lopez related to his death. Mr. Ingram Lopez's grandmother called 911 shortly after 1 a.m. and told the police operator that her grandson was drunk, yelling, and running around the house naked. When the officers arrived at the house, Mr. Carlos Ingram Lopez ran from them into a dark and closed garage where the officers ordered him to the floor, handcuffed him behind his back, and placed him in a prone position, which means they placed him face down. The officers restrained Mr. Ingram Lopez in a prone position for about 12 minutes. Mr. Ingram Lopez went into cardiac arrest, and despite the officers' attempts to revive him, was declared deceased at the scene by emergency medical services personnel. The Pima County Coroner's Office determined that Mr. Ingram Lopez had an extremely high level of cocaine in his system, as well as a pre-existing heart condition. But they could not conclusively determine his cause of death. As part of our investigation into this case, which we initiated ourselves, we have determined that the three involved officers committed multiple policy violations and failed to handle the incident consistent with their training. Okay, so, Professor, uh, we have three officers that there were supposedly multiple uh, policy violations. This chief has offered his resignation should it be accepted. Um, why, I don't know. By all accounts, he's supposedly a very good police chief. Uh, but nevertheless, we talked about this off uh, camera for a little bit. 
You've been a cop. What do you do in these scenarios where there's somebody they're being told is acting erratically, they're under the influence of a heavy dose of cocaine or whatever drug they may be under? Um, there were allegations that during the, the course of this, he was looking for water to drink and no water was provided. W what is the remedy to something like this? And do you believe criminal charges should be filed? Well, in answer to your first question, it's not what a cop should do, it's how the police department should handle these matters. That 911 call meant that there's an emotionally disturbed person. Somebody's naked, they're acting erratically, and they're drunk. Uh, police officers, generally speaking, are not trained to deal with that. Uh, they certainly should respond, but there should be an additional response. Uh, EMS, or mental health professionals. Even in most jurisdictions, the SWAT team or the CAT team uh, would be an appropriate response not to injure this person or to kill them, but because they're trained to deal with hostage negotiation, and they also have non-lethal weapons. When somebody is under the influence of cocaine, one of the worst things you can do is get them to raise their heart rate because they're likely to suffer some type of injury. So, as yeah, I yeah, but Professor, this, let me, I, let me, I'm sorry to cut you off. Let me just jump in here, though. But the cops that are responding to this don't know that. They they don't know that he's under the influence of what kind of drugs or whether there's a mental illness. I mean, I, I know that we know that now because of the coroner's report, but the, how did they, how would you know to call out EMS and, and or hostage negotiation people, uh, teams? There are so many encounters police have every day. How do they possibly do that? Oh, if you, if, easy. If you receive a call that someone's intoxicated and they are running around with no clothes on in front of their grandmother and are uncontrollable, that person is either on drugs or emotionally disturbed or both. I would err on the side of caution and say that is exactly what's going on because that, that is rather erratic, irrational behavior. Uh, mm -hmm. If it walks like a duck and quacks, you don't have to look it up in the encyclopedia to know what it is. So for right. me, that's kind of the starting point. I think you make a great point. I was an EMT for many years, and I've been involved in police practices uh, for 30 years of a career. And it, it is true that they don't send them right out. It's, it's usually the first responders, the police officers, that are calling for those units after they're making the observations. So you make an excellent point, an excellent policy reform change as to when to have those units rolled together uh, to avoid something like this. Uh, the police chief uh, also was giving us some information with regard to whether criminal charges have been filed. To be clear, they have not as of yet. Let's take a listen. Determined that the three involved officers committed multiple policy violations and failed to handle the incident consistent with their training. It is, however, important to note that there is no indication of malicious intent, nor did any of the officers deploy strikes, use chokeholds, or place a knee on Mr. Ingram Lopez's neck. Mr. Ingram Lopez was Hispanic, and the officers involved were both black and white. Neither officers Jackson nor Rutledge have any history of complaints within TPD's Office of Professional Standards, which is the same as basically internal affairs. Officer Starbuck has one sustained complaint. The three primary officers in the case submitted their resignations to the department. All employees have the right to resign at any time. However, the files for these officers reflect that the department would have terminated them had they not resigned. But to demonstrate my willingness to take accountability for these mistakes, I am offering my resignation to the mayor, city council, and city manager, which they can accept or handle as they deem appropriate. Kirk, I gotta be honest with you. I think this chief is really handling this the right way. I mean, number one, he goes through the disciplinary record of the police officers, and I can't say enough, enough, enough about how this transparency with regard to IA records is so important. But these officers apparently did not have significant internal affairs issues, yet they resigned. And the idea that he's willing to resign is really, I think, speaking volumes because He's a police chief. If one of his officers does something wrong, and this is the second police chief to resign in recent weeks, doesn't necessarily mean that you're an ineffective leader. But man, how times have changed in the last couple of weeks with regard to this. It's absolutely amazing. So, and I agree with you. I think the chief here is showing a lot of character. And what he's demonstrating is his willingness to take responsibility because he is in charge, not because he necessarily failed. Uh, he is in charge. He's responsible for training. And as I mentioned about these responses and 
you know, possible responses that could have uh, been, could have occurred here, ultimately, he is responsible for that, for ensuring that certain policies are in place where this may not occur. However, he is being as transparent as possible with uh, all this information at this particular point in time. Um, and that is really the best way to go. The only issue here is we, there's a lot of information we do not have. So we don't know what their training is. We don't know what policies that particular department has in place for incidents like this. The chief alluded to the fact that there were multiple policy violations, but we just don't know uh, what those are. I think it's going to be unlikely you see criminal charges here. He said there was no malicious intent. So that means the officers had to be reckless that they knew are criminally negligent in that they didn't know and they should have known. And it's difficult well, to discern that from the video. You kind of went somewhere I was going to go, so I'm going to put you on the spot with this. I did find that interesting in okay. the conference is that even though they don't have a significant IA record, the reason for that is usually it's called progressive disciplining. Um, at a certain point in time, you get reprimands, and then you get suspensions. It's major discipline, major rule infractions that cause a department to fire a person. And that, all, that uh, chief is basically saying there wasn't any previous history, but there was such egregious conduct, as I'm using my words, that they would have moved to fire them anyway. So I know you said you didn't know all the facts, but what could you think that could be based on all of this? It would have to be, I would think, a clear policy violation. So perhaps once they identified that this person uh, was emotionally disturbed or under the influence, perhaps they were mandated to call uh, EMS. For instance, in New York, I'm sure this policy is still in place, but all police officers are mandated to call a supervisor, the patrol supervisor, uh, when dealing with an emotionally disturbed person and so forth. Perhaps they should have uh, been, they were mandated to use some form of non lethal weapons. But you're, you're absolutely correct, Bob. He made it very clear that there were gross policy violations and they would have been fired as a result of those policy violations. I, I think that your commentary is going to be prescient. I think it's going to have something to do with the appropriate response uh, medically with respect to that, rather than to continue to engage in, in the conduct uh, that ultimately led to his death. That, and still, we have to figure out what that is from the medical examiner, because there's a little wobbliness with respect to that. Uh, just real quick. Real quick, uh, 10 seconds or less, do you believe, based on your training and experience, criminal charges should be filed? I don't think so here. I'm going to go out on a limb. I don't think so. And if criminal charges should be filed, then they should be filed against, you know, the patrol supervisor and the entire police department, because there's a fall down in policy here. Excellent. Well, Professor, you're always great. This, again, is the Law and Crime Network and our special report, Keeping the Peace. I will be back tomorrow. Our regular scheduling program will be coming up. Stay tuned. Thank you.